Good evening, everyone. It's lovely to see you all here tonight. I'm Sue, and I'm a member here at the Buddhist Society, and Len is from Higher Griever. And we're here to talk about um, a project that we're working on called the Pure Land of the Indestructible Buddha. Just we, we refer to it as the Pure Land. And the idea is to develop um, a care home for people who are dying, who want to be in a spiritual environment. And actually, it was many years ago now that I heard about this here during a range retreat when someone from Higher Griever came and talked about the fact that they wanted to do, do this. And I thought that would be a great um, occupation for my retirement. So I joined all those years ago and started work on it. <laughs> And that was quite a while ago, and then I retired, and that was quite a while ago. I'm on my sixth year of retirement. Um, but we have come quite a long way. There's a lot that you have to do to establish an entity, a business entity, and that's all been done. And we have actually a developer who has a house that we are going to have redeveloped to, um, to the... the, the um, the idea is to make it suitable for disabled people, so disabled access, but also suitable for years later if our developer wants to rent it out. So the idea of the home is that people will come and stay for a week or two. Um, that will provide a spiritual environment for them and um, respite for their carers as well. And so we have our developer. He's willing to let us rent his redeveloped home for a pilot project that we're going to run for three years. And the object of that will be to see if we can get enough support to keep it going, enough people interested, and if it's actually possible to do what we want to achieve, to assess the service that we're able to provide for people. And if it is, we hope to go ahead and run it permanently. Apart from um, our developer, we've got a, an architect who is um, a member of our group, and he's giving his services free to, to design the, the building. And we've got a designer who is going to take care of the, the inner fittings um, and access so that people are able to live comfortably. And so now we're in a state where we would have been able to start building. However, COVID came along, and I don't need to tell you how awkward that was. Apart from the not being able to get together and meet, there was also the fact that somehow all the um, tradies seemed to have evaporated. I don't know where they went. I suspect foul play. I don't know where, where would they go. But anyway, the fact is you can't really build, be sure when you start a building project that you'll be able to finish it. So our, our um, developer is nervous and doesn't want to start yet. So in the meantime, we haven't been idle. We developed um, an education program for people who'd work in the center, and we've been doing that this year. We did two modules earlier on, and we've got one for September. And that's so that people can start to develop um, their ways of dealing with dying people. It's not, it's not simple. And our next one coming up after that will be perhaps to talk to dying people. If we can't have them in a center, we could talk to them. And that's where we are at the moment, coming up to our third module of education and hoping that we'll get support for, from people in the long term so that we're able to continue the project. Part of the education program was what Len is going to share with you. Um, here at the Buddhist Society, we have wonderful teachings, but the, I don't recall anyone teaching us about what happens after you die. But the teachings that Len um, is, has access to does talk about that. And once I heard it, I must say I realized it's a really good idea. And so that's what we want to share with you tonight. And there, there will be time, I'm sure, for, you to, for us to talk about it afterwards. So handing over to you, Len. to work. Yeah, right, hello everybody and uh, I must say it's always a pleasure to come to Dharmaloka. Thank you for the invitation. 
Uh, and as Sue has said, uh, just, just to be clear, my, my name is Len Warren. I'm chairperson of our small Buddhist um, charity, which is called Small, it's small, small uh, organisation, but it's got a long name. The Pure Land of the Indestructible Buddha. So I'm the chairperson and Sue is the deputy chairperson. And as she's, she's uh, told you, um, our objective is to create a peaceful and virtuous environment for those people who want to focus on the emotional and spiritual side in their last days. So why would it be important to focus on the spiritual side? It, uh, just as you're dying, you might ask. Well, fundamentally, because one of the teachings of the Buddha was that the state of your mind at the moment of death can determine which throwing karma will ripen and propel you into your next life. So providing um, the worst of your pain is under control, and these days, generally that's the case, not, not always. Uh, providing that's done, then um, spiritual issues are probably the most important thing to focus on as you're dying. And that's why we want to build a facility uh, where we can give people uh, support and every chance to make the most of this precious opportunity. And these days, um, death is, is still something that people try and avoid talking about. I don't think many people would think of it as a precious opportunity. But we do, and because it's so different, and so much of Buddhism is different, of course, and almost opposite to what's happening in our society. Um, because it's so different, um, it's, it's strange to a lot of people, and to get people on side and involved is not a simple matter. So carers, if you're a carer at the Pure Land, looking after people, then you will have been exposed to some of these concepts the ones I'm going to talk about and what I've mentioned so far. And that means you'll be able to do your job better, you'll have a better idea of what the dying person is going through, what stage they're at, and you'd be able to do a better job. And personally, you will be able to face your own death with less fear, because you'll know what's coming. So tonight, I want to give you a taste um, of one of the Mahayana Buddhist insights, namely the eight stages of the dying process. And hopefully it will whet your appetite and you might want to follow up some of these concepts. So what I'm going to present comes from His Holiness the Dalai Lama, Lama Zopa Rinpoche, Venerable Choki, Venerable Dondrup, and Geshe Tashi Sering. Um, now, before we talk about the eight stages, I think it's important to get the background straight and some definitions clear. So the first one is that is, is the idea that during the dying process, our mind is more subtle. It's, it's uh, right at the end, it's almost like it's clairvoyant. And you can understand what's in other people's minds, what they're thinking. Um, and because of that, if you're a carer or, or a loved one, um, thoughts that you have, like silent prayer and so on, 
um, are felt by the dying person and ha have a big effect. So you don't really have to talk much when, when the end is near um, because the dying person can sense what's going on and you can encourage them to let go into the light. Now the second point of, of sort of background is that because of what's happening at, at the time of death, there will be some external signs, things to do with your body, and you, you will be able to see some of these in the person you're looking after and they'll, be, they'll happen to you at the time of your death. So there'll be external signs where the body, um, I'll, I'll mention it in a minute, um, does certain things. And there are internal experiences, uh, including visions. So that each of these eight stages is associated with some sort of physical uh, effect and some psychological effect. Now in, in the description I'm going to use, um, we use the concept of um, <clears throat> a sentient being being comprised of uh, five elements. Earth, water, fire, and conscious uh, air or wind, that's four the four physical ones, and then consciousness. So it's, it's a way of thinking about a sentient being and saying, yes, those four, or five rather, cover what it is to be, say, a human being. And we'll talk more about those as we go. Um, so another, another point is this, that at death, our true nature will be revealed. It will happen um, automatically. We don't have to bring it on. We don't have to know about it. But as at the last moment, our deepest level of mind, the real you, will dawn. So, in a way, you, you might say, well, what, what exactly is happening? Well, in a way, um, we're returning to our original state. Um, everything uh, dissolves, the mind and the body unravel. Uh, the three poisons of ignorance, um, afflicted, de afflicted desire and uh, anger, uh, die, and um, that means that without the negative emotions, um, you can you then go through these phases of dissolution, uh, the outer dissolution of the four elements, or the physical elements, and the inner dissolution where the consciousness dissolves into ever more subtle levels of your mind. And the concept is that there are three basic levels of mind. There's a gross mind that goes with your body and finishes when you die. And there's a subtle mind and a very subtle mind. And once you can realize the very subtle mind, you, you basically achieved enlightenment. So that's uh, the outer and inner dissolutions, and they, well, I'll explain in a moment why they're called dissolutions. And now comes the definition of death, just to get that clear. Um, from, from the, or at least the Mahayana Buddhist point of view, death is when the mind separates from the body. It's quite different to the Western medical definition, which is when the breathing ceases or when the circulation ceases. Um, now the body doesn't lose all its uh, ability 
<clears throat> to sustain this consciousness at once. It does so gradually. Uh, as each of the elements of, of uh, earth, water, fire and air dissolve. And what happens first is that the earth element, which is the hard substances of your body, like your, your um, bo um, bones and so on, that dissolves into the water element. Now when we say the word dissolve, what we mean is that the earth element ceases to function. Your body, the hard parts of your body cease to function properly. And that role is taken up then by the, wa the water element of your body or the liquids, the fluids of your body. And that um, comes to the fore. And then the water element dissolves into the fire element the fire element dissolves into the wind element and the wind dissolves into the consciousness and then finally all those um, less subtle levels of consciousness dissolve into the most subtle fundamental innate mind. So when we talk about dissolving, what we mean is that that element loses its ability to function properly and therefore it can't sustain your consciousness. Uh, the seventh point of, of background is that um, ordinary people, and by ordinary I mean people who haven't thought about death, people who haven't read about it and given it some consideration, Ordinary people at the time of death are basically out of control. Um, they're under the control of their karma. And because they haven't trained themselves during this life and they don't know what's coming, they can be overwhelmed by the experience and be very fearful, frightened. because all the elements of their body are uh, no longer functioning harmoniously, they've gone out of balance. Things are happening that they are not, uh, not prepared for and not, not aware of what's happening. And yet, once you know about these things, you can use that knowledge to remove the fear, um, and also you can use that knowledge to actually achieve um, a very high state of meditation. So just finally to say that each of these eight stages that I'm going to talk through uh, has its own physical effects and its own psychological effects. And we'll, we'll see what they are. So first of all, I'm going to read a poem which summarizes the first part of the process, a poem, or one, one verse of a poem, uh, by the Panchen Lama. May we generate a powerful mind of virtue when the four elements, earth, water, fire, and wind, dissolve in stages and physical strength is lost the mouth and nose dry and pucker, warmth withdraws, breaths are gasped, and rattling sounds emerge. So as we've said, the process of dying involves these eight stages. The first four are to do with the collapse of the physical elements and the last four are to do with the um, consciousness becoming more and more refined. So what do we mean by the four elements? Well, as I've mentioned, water, I mean, sorry, uh, the earth means the hard substances of your body. Water means the fluid substances of your body. 
Fire, we're talking about the heat of your body that's generated by digestion and that maintains your life. Uh, wind, we're talking about the currents of air from, from breathing and other currents that create movement, movement of your limbs, uh, swallowing, speaking, and all, all the, the movement functions of the body. And when we talk about the eight stages, I mentioned there's a physical effect and a psychological effect. Well, the, one of the psychological effects is that you see visions. Each of these eight stages, you will see a particular vision and you can recognize the stage you're at if, if you're aware of these visions. Um, and so a good way of remembering what's happening is to remember what visions you're going to experience. And they are, first of all, a mirage, you know, on a hot summer's day and you're driving down the bitumen road and shimmering in the distance you see all this water. But when you get there, there's no water. It's a mirage. Uh, after mirage comes smoke. Um, you will feel that you're in a room full of smoke. The next one is, is fireflies or sparks where you will see these sparks of light. The next one is a flame, a flame of a candle or the, the flickering light above a, a flame. And then we come to the four um, non-physical dissolutions. And first of all, you'll see what's called a white appearance. A brilliant white light will appear to you. That white light will change into a red light, even stronger, more brilliant. The red light will change into a black blackness, not a nothingness, a blackness. And while everything is black, you will then um, faint, basically, pass out. When you come to, which it will happen very quickly, you are then in the last stage, which is the mind of the clear light, the mind of the clear light of death, your fundamental, innate, deepest mind that will appear as a very clear autumn sky. Now, if you can recognize that and dissolve into it, then you can stay meditating. For most of us, when that clear light dawns, we'll hardly recognize it. It will come and it will go. And if you're not trained and, and ready for it, um, you won't, probably won't notice anything. So that's, that's what the eight stages are. That's one way of remembering them. So now we'll go through them in a little bit more detail. Um, and you can either just listen to the words and try and understand what I'm saying, or you could imagine that it's actually happening to you. <clears throat> so the first thing that happens is that the earth element degenerates and dissolves into the water element. And as we've said, that means that the solid aspects of the body, such as bone, are no longer able to function properly and can't serve as a basis for your consciousness. And that capacity passes on, dissolves into, or is transferred to the water element, the fluids of the body, like blood, phlegm. Um, at the same time, your body um, loses all strength and becomes noticeably thinner, and your limbs become very loose.
uh, at this stage you start to seriously lose your sight. You can't, everything appears dark and you can't see much at all and you can't close or open your eyes. And you may have a sense that you're sinking into the earth. You may, and some people even call out, hold me up. And they fight and try and, as if they're trying to get out while they're being pressed into the earth. But of course there's no point in struggling because this is all your imagination and it's best to remain calm and try and have a virtuous attitude. And it's the, during this process that you see the mirage. That's, that's the first stage. The second stage is that the capacity of the, the water element to sustain your consciousness um, degenerates and it passes to the fire element which is the warmth that maintains the body. And the fire element is now a major function, that, that heat of, of holding the consciousness in your body. And at this point, you can no longer experience pleasure or pain or neutral feelings. Uh, your mouth and tongue dry up, your throat dries, due to loss of saliva, scum forms on your teeth. And other fluids like uh, urine and blood start to dry up. In the first stage, you lost the ability to see properly. Now you lose the ability to hear anything. Even that uh, sound that you hear in your ears when everything's completely silent, that, that goes as well. And what you see in your mind, the vision that you experience <clears throat> is um, puffs of smoke or being in a room with smoke billowing all around you. So the third stage to do with the fire element um, because the fire element now starts to degenerate and it dissolves into the wind element, which are the currents of air or energy that I mentioned. Uh, they direct various bodily functions like inhalation, exhalation, burping, spitting, speaking, swallowing, flexing joints. So you're, you're, that, that takes precedence and uh, supports the consciousness. Because you're losing the fire element, um, the warmth in your body starts to disappear and it contracts towards your heart. <clears throat> and because, because of that, you no longer have the ability to digest food. So you're not interested in eating or drinking. And if you've been with dying people, you might recognize some of these symptoms. And a common response to when the loved ones won't eat or drink anything is to try and pump them full of food and even give them drips uh, of moisture because they're dry, everything's drying up. But it's not necessary because this is a natural process. This is what happens. <clears throat> uh, at this stage also, you start to uh, lose your memory. You can't remember the names of your family that are around you. Um, you don't know what they do. You experience difficulty breathing. Your inhalations become uh, shorter and your exhalations become longer. Um, and this is when your throat emits rattling or gasping sounds. And what you see, the vision you see, is the fireflies vision, the sparks. 
And then stage four is, is when the wind element degenerates and dissolves into consciousness. Uh, your tongue becomes thick and short and, and the root turns blue. Um, you lose the sense of feeling of touch. You can't sense any, anybody touching you again, uh, anymore. Um, you lose your smell and your taste. And at this point, the breath through the nostrils ceases. And medically, you could be certified as having died. But from the, the Buddhist point of view, uh, you're not dead because the mind has not left the body. That's, that's the definition of death. So what, what we've got at this stage is that all our physical functions have finished, the body's finished, but the mind is still there. And of course, as, as we know, um, with, with uh, many lives that we've lived, we've built up all these uh, karmic imprints on our mind. And they, the, the, what, what, they haven't ripened yet, and they will ripen. Um, and one will ripen at the time of death. And if it's, if it's a strong one, then it's going to propel you into your next life. Um, and then there'll be other karma that determines whether that life um, is, is tolerable or not. So again, you come to the point that your mental state at the time of death is so important. And it's so important to try and keep it virtuous. And we always say the simplest way to think of a virtuous mind in this situation is simply if you feel grateful. If you feel grateful for the help that you're being given by your carers, the nurses, the doctors, that's a virtuous mind. I mean, most of us will be terrified because we're losing everything that we're familiar with. Um, and to think of others at that point is really difficult. <clears throat> so now we come to the final four phases of death, which is to do with the mind. And the first stage is when the gross mind, the mind that's been attached to your body, uh, dissolves into the subtle mind and you'll see this white appearance like an autumn sky before dawn. The white appearance will then become an even more bright red light. Um, very clear, very beautiful. Um, and this, this is the mind dissolving into, into a more subtle layer. Then in stage seven, you'll have the black, what they call the black near attainment. When the mind, when you experience the blackness. And as I mentioned, after a while in this blackness, you will pass out. And when you come to the most amazing uh, light, the clear light mind of death will dawn. And it dawns of its own accord. Um, so there's no conceptual activity. You don't have to think about this. It's just there, it happens. It's non-conceptual, it's non-dualistic. Um, this is your deepest consciousness, your fundamental, innate, clear-like mind. So for most people, once that clear-like mind dawns, they will die. The mind will leave the body and go into the intermediate state between this, uh, between this life and the next life. But for a trained yogi, 
when the clear light mind dawns, they can uh, merge with it and stay in that clear light for hours, days, even weeks. And remember, this is in a state where there's no breath, there's no circulation of blood, technically you're dead. But these yogis um, can stay, as it were, alive, sitting in meditation, um, the body not decaying, even in the terrible hot climate of India. Um, the many cases, even, even today, there are tested um, cases, even in the last few years of this, this happening. So if, if you're highly trained, and probably doesn't apply, certainly doesn't apply to me, um, you can do this. But even, even sincere, ordinary people can stay in that clear light for a few hours, or maybe a day or two. So we always say that if, if you're in a, uh, not in a conducive situation, not in, in our spiritual hospice, for example, but in a hospital, say, um, they won't understand all this. And as soon as you're technically dead, they'll want to move you out. Whereas um, we're saying, no, just leave the body. The person now is in a very delicate state. We don't want noise, we don't want wailing. We don't want crying. Um, their mind is right at the end. They might be able to perceive this uh, clear light mind and we don't want to disturb them until there are signs that actually the mind has left and as soon as it leaves, the body will start to smell. So, in conclusion, um, I thought I'd just read this couple of sentences here from the Dalai Lama. He says, the cornerstone of my own practice is reflection on the four basic teachings of impermanence, suffering, emptiness, and selflessness. In addition, as a part of eight different daily ritual practices. Each one of them, I meditate on the stages of dying. Thus, at the time of death, these steps will supposedly be familiar. But whether I will succeed or not, I do not know. So that's uh, all we've got time for tonight, but it gives you a flavour of what the teachings are. And it, I hope it also gives you a flavour um, for why we're trying to set up this special type of hospice. Because we believe that time of death is so important and that most people don't understand this. And by having carers and an environment that's conducive and, and that people are, where people are trained to be aware of these things, um, we can help people have a more peaceful death and a happier next life. And if we can do that for just one person, I'd be so happy, I'd be totally over the moon. It'd be the most wonderful thing. So that's where we are. Um, there is time for a few questions, although it is getting late. So, um, thank you so so much, Len and Sue. That is just amazing. Um, it's. Yeah, I don't really have words for it. But I just wondered, are you going to be... Um, you know, I only recently discovered that you don't actually have to have a funeral service nowadays. No, you don't. No. It's not, not by law. Yeah, so is the hospice you're creating, the, the pure land of the indestructible Buddha, 
Um, are you going to be looking after the burial process as no. well, the cremation process? No. no, we won't. Yeah, I just w wondered how that would work, that transition between... Yeah. No. No, yeah. we'll be like a normal hospice in, in the sense that we'll be looking after the person until the moment the mind leaves the body. Um, and that may be hours or maybe even days after they've clinically died. But then it will be up to the carers, the family and others to decide what sort of burial, funeral and so on. Uh, it's interesting because the, the um, tradition in, in Tibet, they don't, they don't have funerals. So it's a, quite a different... They spend all their time praying that this person will have a happy rebirth. And there are various practices for that. So instead of having the funeral, they have rituals and services where they pray that the person who's just died actually gets through the intermediate state safely and has a happy rebirth, which is rather nice. Yes, um, I can't remember the name of it, but there is a new type of funeral service. Not really a funeral service, but I think the group is called Tender. Oh, like yeah. Tender. Yeah, I've heard tender. other people mention tender. this. <laughs> wasn't, wasn't there a program on the... Ra on the TV or yeah, something? Yeah, it was yeah. on the Australian story. It was very inspiring. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. They basically help you to... Um, they bring the family together to care for the, um, like the deceased's body and bury it or cremate it in a way that's respectful and, you know, speaks a bit more truth. Yeah. Yeah, anyway. Um, thank you, Len and Sue. Um, just takes me back to when my son passed away. Um, he was 30 and it was unexpected death. And how grateful I was. Um, I'm a member of the Japanese Buddhism, Soka Gokai. And how wonderful it was that we, have a, we had a board and that we could put on the board, people that we needed to, for prayer, for prayer, um, and basically for 40, I think it's 42 days, they say that they pray that this, their spirit, their essence doesn't leave. This Maybe this is what you call that, um, the, the, that deep, deep mind. But how, how it's, it helped me so much that other people that, all the Buddhist community were actually chanting and praying for my son. Mm. It just, it was so, at times I went from, from you know, from really deep, deep, um, just hell mm. to rapture because I felt this incredible energy mm. of caring and higher realms actually um, Chanting for my son, mm. so it was that was so so deeply heartfelt for me, mm. Mm. and you basically helped me to remember that. So thank you. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's wonderful. In fact, it's um, forty nine days. Um, they say that when you enter the intermediate state, after a week, you die a little death if you haven't found a rebirth. And then you have another week, and it goes on for up to seven weeks, which is 49 days. And by that stage, almost everybody has found a rebirth. And that's why they, they pray. Actually, it calls to mind some of the um, 
assuming that this is true, then you'd say misconceptions that people have that you can actually die and then sort out all the things you did wrong as if you could convince somebody that um, you're sorry and you deserve a good life. Whereas in actual fact, the process seems to be quite quick and almost organized, and there is no discussion. It simply is, it is what it is. So it does rather remind you of um, retiring, where they say, if you're going to do anything, don't put it off. Because it kind of you might die, and, or you know you won't be able to walk properly. You can't do the things you want to do. But I, it occurs to me that's actually true for everybody. If there's someone you need to apologise to, or forgive, or make amends, don't put it off. Because most people don't know when they're going to die. It comes as a surprise to most of us. Even if you know you've got a terminal condition, you don't know when it's going to actually be the end. And actually, once you're dead, it's too late. You really have to do it now, so don't put it off. Mm. It's so easy, we're very busy, right? <laughs> As they say, mm. when you go to sleep at night, you don't know what's going to come first, tomorrow or the next life. Yes, that's right. They do say that. Mm. So, is the life review a real thing? <laughs> uh, well, I'd say if it's going to happen, it should happen sooner rather than later. Oh, no, no, no. What I mean is um, um, quite often people who have had near-death experiences talk about having this life review and mm. they... They remember all these different stages of their life from when they're very small mm. to That's recent right. times. Is that a real phenomenon, you think? I think it must be if so many people talk yeah. about it. Yeah. But bearing in mind that if it's a near death, then you didn't actually die. So there isn't anything quite like death. You, you don't come back and tell people about it. But we rely on the word of the Buddha and, and great teachers. Uh, as, far, as far as I understand, the life review is a real thing and it can happen in those the first four phases of, of first four stages when you've still got your consciousness uh, and it can cause if, if you've if you've lived a good life then you'll be blissful and you'll have a be, be in a happy state and if you haven't you'll get very agitated and some people do get very agitated uh, at that stage. Mm. And also, in the intermediate state, if you, if you get that far and you haven't had a life review, there is said to be a life review in the intermediate state. So as far as, far as I'm concerned, um, the great yogis who've, who've had experiences of these things, um, yeah, they talk about the life review. You know, the classic thing about putting white stones for all the good things you've done and black stones for all the terrible things you've done and says. Yes. Um, just another question. I have heard that um, what's well, been said that some family members actually, when they um, the person is dying or before they die, they actually start to see visions of maybe their family coming in or of spirit actually being with them. Can you comment on that, please? Um, this is before the person dies. Yes, before they their, die. Their, their loved ones. Have visions? Uh, no, they have visions of their loved ones coming to meet them. All oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, as far as I know, there are there are many reports of that. And um, the other thing that's similar is that there are many reports of people, not with the dying person, but close to them, like like um, family members close to them 
but they're away for some reason. And at the moment of death of, the, of that person that they're not with, they will feel something. Something will change and they will experience something yeah. at that moment. Mm. So that's similar, but it's not the same. Um, yeah. yeah. Mm. Thank you. And, and just, just to say, you know, finding the way you found the Buddhist teaching so helpful when your son died, um, yeah, isn't that, isn't that wonderful? Mm. It, it really is. Um, and the same, same thing happened to me when our son died. And uh, that's when I found Buddhism. And it gave me something to, uh, that I could do. Because at that stage, before, before I found Buddhism, I didn't even believe in future lives. And if you don't believe in future lives, and a lot of this falls very flat and doesn't apply. So, yeah, it's, it's all, you know. Any more questions? Okay, uh, th thank you very much, Len and Sue, for your uh, presentation tonight, and it's much appreciated. Please show your appreciation. Thank you.